Hello, Teach 2017. How are you all doing today? All right. How are you all doing today? All right. I am so excited to be here. When I first got asked to come give part of the plenary, I was excited for a couple of key reasons. The first of which was that I get to hear from some of our amazing heroes of this movement. So a big round of applause for Gavin. And I'm also really excited to hear from Jeff Duncan Andrade, our next speaker. He's incredible, so a big round of applause for him. But I'm also excited to be here because in no other place are there 1,400 of the most powerful educators all meeting together to talk about what's best for kids, and that's all of you. So give yourselves a big round of applause. I also come here as a former teacher on the south side of Chicago. Is Illinois or Chicago in the house today? Yeah. Excellent. Um, and so when I was a teacher on the south side of Chicago, many of my students were dealing with the effect of adversity and trauma in their lives. And I didn't have any tools to deal with it. And so for me, I wanted to make sure that we could create classrooms and, and school environments that were helpful for them. And so what I want to talk about today is a little bit of the research on the brain. And so this is my school. This is my classroom. Uh, I do the work that I do because of Cortez. Um, you might imagine that Cortez is the one uh, in out, out of uniform on the bottom right there. But Cortez is slick, you know, he has a blue shirt on, uh, but he has a white shirt on underneath, you know, so he's still in uniform, as he used to tell me, right? And Cortez came to me after the sixth grade in the 15th percentile in reading on the ISAT. So I thought my number one priority was to help him learn how to read. That was my number one thing. And so we created a classroom environment that was trusting, that built relationships with all of our students, and that allowed him to access the rigor that we put forward. And after eighth grade, I'm happy to say that he was at the 71st percentile in reading on the ISAT. But the reality is that Cortez has been out in and out of jail for the last five years. I could create that classroom environment that helped him learn, but I didn't know the skills and mindsets that would be necessary for him to succeed later in life like self-regulation and stress management and self-awareness. And so that's why I do the work that I do. At Turnaround for Children, our vision is that one day, all children in the United States will attend schools that prepare them for the lives they choose, including children like Cortez. The thing that we think is most important is to connect the dots between science, the science of adversity, and school performance to catalyze healthy student development and academic achievement. So that's our role, that's what we wanna do in the world. This year, we'll be partnering with 13 schools in New York, DC, and Newark, with over 600 teachers and leaders that we'll be supporting in 5,000 students. So we work in schools every single day, but we actually wanna change the conversation in this country in education reform. We wanna make sure that science is at the core of education reform. We want to answer the question, what if the U.S. education system used science to drive change? And so we've partnered with a number of organizations to try and codify the best research about brain science in particular, and that we're calling it the science of learning and development. And so I want to start off our talk about the science today with a story that some of you may be familiar with. How many of you are familiar with the marshmallow test? A number of you were. So the basics were a bunch of researchers out of Stanford about 50 years ago started to do some research to try and understand the, the science of delaying gratification. And so they created these little studies where a child had a marshmallow in front of them. And then they said, if you can wait just 15 minutes, we'll give you a second marshmallow. And so they did all of this research and they were able to tell that the amount of time that you waited was correlated with all sorts of things for the rest of your life like SAT scores, adult income, teenage pregnancy rates, life expectancy, something as intractable as life ex expectancy. But this created a narrative that was pretty dangerous, a narrative around morality and character, a narrative that put a lot of the onus on that child. And so there was a researcher recently in the, at the University of Rochester who said, this doesn't quite pass the smell test for me. She worked at a homeless shelter and for her, the children and families that she worked with, they weren't necessarily having an issue with delaying gratification. They might not know where their next meal was coming from. They might not know where they were gonna sleep at night. 
some of the same things that Cortez and some of my own students were dealing with. And so she decided to do a little study within the study. So what she did was she had all the children come into the waiting room one by one, and she would give them some art supplies to play with. And so for all of the students, she gave them some broken crayons. And for half the students, she gave them those broken crayons and said, oh, I'm sorry, we have some other crayons. I'll be back with those other crayons. And so for half the students, she came back and she said, oh, sorry, we didn't have any of those crayons. Just a little waiting room interaction. And then they did the marshmallow test. And what they found was across all sorts of demographics in that study, if you didn't get the box of crayons as promised, you waited only on average three minutes, which was significantly less than previous. In fact, only one student in the whole test actually waited the 15 minutes for the marshmallow. But if you were actually given the box of crayons as promised in the waiting room, 10, 15 minutes before, you were four times as likely to actually wait for that second marshmallow. So if you had an experience where you had a trusting adult that you interacted with, you were dramatically more likely to do something that there was a narrative about life expectancy. So the question is a fundamentally equitable question. It's a question of equity. If we know that there's science telling us that you can do things dramatically differently on something as seemingly intractable as life expectancy, the question now is for us as adults. What schools and classrooms are we going to create as a result? This is one of my favorite pictures. It's a picture of one of our schools and the principal and a child. This picture obviously tells a thousand words about what's going on, but it's more than just a hug. And so today I want to get into a little bit of the science of what's going on behind this hug, so I'll come back to it. The key question for us and the question that we're answering is that adversity doesn't just happen to children, it happens inside their brains and their bodies through the biological mechanism of stress. I want to say this again, adversity doesn't just happen to you and then it's over. You don't just have a traumatic event happen to you and then you're done. You actually have it get inside your brain and your body. It changes the biochemistry of a child's brain and body. So this is really important because it sticks with you. If you go through a traumatic event, it doesn't just end there, it stays with you. And we'll get into the parts of the brain where this actually happens. So the key here is that stress matters. So the, the stress hormone is cortisol, and many of you might be familiar with cortisol, even if you don't know the word cortisol. For some of you, it might be that you're in the forest and you run into a bear, maybe a grizzly bear. <laughs> For others of you, it may be a stop at the grocery store where you feel like you lost your child for a moment. For some of us, it may be speaking in front of a thousand of the most powerful educators around the country. Your hands start to get clammy, hair stands up on the back of your neck, your heart starts to beat a little fast. That's actually the impact of cortisol flooding your brain and your body. And for some of us, we can have that be manageable. That can happen for that one moment and then it goes right back down. But if you've had adversity and trauma happen to you multiple times, you actually become locked in fight, flight, or freeze. You don't actually go about the day without it. That's how you go into schools, that's how you go into your classrooms. So stress matters. The key question, if you understand that stress matters, is how does this then impact the developing brain, behavior, and learning? And then what can we do with this knowledge? And so this is the part where we're gonna learn some science phrases today. And we actually think it's really important for teachers and leaders and even students to understand these words because that helps them understand what's going on inside them. And so the first word that we're gonna talk about today is the amygdala. And the amygdala is a critical part of the brain for a number of reasons, but most important is that it actually remembers every traumatic event that you've ever been through. It's the reason why walking into a room and smelling something, hearing a voice, a tone, a noise, can take you right back to that place. And this is a fantastic thing if you're out in the forest or if you're about to get hit by a car, you need to react. So it's great for survival, it's not great for learning. But we don't understand the amygdala as teachers. When I was in my teacher prep program, I certainly didn't hear anything about the amygdala or what's going on in the brain. 
So what's important about the amygdala is that it talks to the other parts of the brain. So it stamps that traumatic event, and then it remembers when things are like that traumatic event. So it's really good at noticing things that seem like a real threat, really bad at noticing the difference between what seems like a real threat and what's a real threat. So the other part of the brain is the hippocampus. And this part of the brain is the one that's in charge of learning and memory. And for us as teachers, this is critical. Now, the amygdala and the hippocampus communicate with each other, which is really powerful. But when the amygdala takes over as the smoke signal to the brain and says, I'm in charge now, the hippocampus actually can't do its job. So for those of us who are teachers and have wondered, students who are going through adversity, going through a traumatic event in their life, they're not able to retain information that they might have just learned. That's actually because the hippocampus that's in charge of retaining that information shuts down when they're under stress. The third part of the brain that's important is the prefrontal cortex. And this is the part of the brain that's in charge of attention, self-regulation, and executive function. Many of the things that are important for students to be successful in school and life after. But this part, too, is impacted by the amygdala. When that amygdala is taken over and in charge, the prefrontal cortex isn't able to actually do those things that it's supposed to do. So it's this information about the brain that is critical for us to think about what's going on underneath the skin of our students. The other part of research that I want to get into is the research around adversity. How many of you have heard of adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs? Oh, that's great. So they wanted to do some research about 20 years ago. So Kaiser Permanente did some research to try and figure out what are the experiences that children grow through that are most impactful for them. And so they found 10 experiences that are really impactful. And these are everything from childhood abuse and neglect to witnessing violence against the mother. These aren't things like, I had a grandmother, she was 95, she passed away, it was sad, and I thought about her a lot. These are experiences like, I don't know where my next meal is coming from. I don't know where I'm gonna sleep at night. Many of the things that Cortez and some of my other students went through. One of the things that's important to note on this research, though, is that it doesn't include research around racial trauma, systemic oppression, or stereotypes. This is the really exciting new body of research that's coming out there and until we recognize the impact of those things, we won't be able to truly change the system in the way that it needs changing. The impact of those adverse experiences is powerful. The data, you can't ignore. The thing to remember, though, is that none of those 10 experiences are things that children actually chose to do. Those are not personality traits or things that are about that child. Those are experiences that are happening to them, often at the hands of a supposedly trusted adult. And so the data is profound. For children that have been through just four or more of those experiences, they're 32 times more likely to have learning and behavior problems in school. They're also 10 to 12 times greater risk for intravenous drug use or attempted suicide. This is another aspect that has a narrative around it that's about blame. That's about blame for the end action of people without understanding the cause much earlier on. So this is about life and death. In fact, eight out of the 10 leading causes of death in the US are correlated with four or more ACEs. And if you have six or more of those, like many of my students did, your average lifespan is decreased by nearly 20 years. So we cannot ignore this research. We cannot ignore the science if we are truly committed to equity. The reality is that this isn't just Cortez. This isn't just one or two students in the corner struggling. Some research out of Washington State paints a very different picture. In fact, just six Students in the average classroom of 30 had no ACEs. That means that 80% of students in the average high school classroom in Washington State 
had at least one adverse childhood experience. Even more than that, one third had four or more. So if I were to tell you that we knew that one third of our average classroom was 32 times more likely to have learning and behavior problems in school because of nothing that they did, what should we do? That's the question we're trying to answer. Even more powerfully, one in 10 had more than six. So one in 10 students in this average classroom were on track to have a lifespan decreased by 20 years. So this is not, we cannot ignore this. The other thing is that our classrooms are evolving, as you all know. In fact, in the average classroom of 30 right now, seven live in poverty, six are victims of abuse, one is homeless. So this is not an issue that is going away. This is only going to become more prevalent. So these children, our children, are walking into our schoolhouse doors with a backpack of experiences. But they don't leave that backpack right at the door for you and then say, I'm ready. They bring that backpack with them through the hallways, classrooms, playgrounds, because that backpack is their brain. What greets them on the other side of that door? Is it a school that the research says needs to have positive, predictable, safe environments, trusting relationships, the skills and mindsets that are most connected according to the research with healthy student development and academic achievement, or is it a place that escalates and re-triggers and re-traumatizes children? The good news is that this is a fundamentally optimistic story. The brain is a malleable thing. We often get the question, but what about all the other things that children experience when they go home? It's a great question. The reality, though, is that the brain is plastic. Every single experience that a child has with a trusted adult creates new neural pathways in the brain that are positive and that are helpful for them later on. So this is a fundamentally optimistic story about the brain. We can actually design learning environments, classrooms, schools, that meet children where they are and correct for the impact of stress and adversity. So this is a fundamentally positive story. I think back to that picture. Just our eyes can tell us that this is more than just a hug. But the reality is that there's something going on inside both the child and the teacher. In that moment, oxytocin, which is the love hormone, is increasing. And oxytocin can help to mitigate the impact of cortisol. So in this moment, it's more than just a hug. You are changing the biochemistry of a child's brain in this moment. So if we know that it's possible, if we know the power that we carry to actually change the biochemistry of a child's brain, what do we do? The answer isn't necessarily to give more hugs, although that wouldn't be bad. Because it's not the physical interaction that's most important of what's going on here. It's actually the fact that a child knows there is an adult who knows me and knows what I need. And that that child knows that they're going to get it. That they're going to have experiences with trusted adults where they get what they need. That's the power in this moment. And so all of you are incredibly powerful people. Yes, you're educators, but you're also brain builders. Think about what might be different if all of us walked into our schools, our classrooms, thinking of how am I going to build every single one of my children's brains today? How am I going to change the biochemistry of the children in my class's brains today? Is every single interaction going to lead with a question in my head of will my tone, the words that I use, the actions that I take, build trust with this child or erode trust? That is the fundamental power that you all carry. So for us, the key question at Turnaround is not just to celebrate the stories of children who are beating the odds. Those are powerful and they're important, but we cannot stop there. 
we must actually use science, the science of the brain, to change the odds for our students. If we knew that a third of every classroom was 32 times more likely to have learning and behavior problems through no fault of their own, what charge is it then on us as adults in this system? We can't just keep asking children to beat the odds themselves and carry the burden of overcoming their obstacles, of overcoming their challenges. We must use science to change the odds for them so that one day their odds are much more likely that they can succeed in life. Thank you.